Thank you for your warm welcome. Thank you for those kind words. It's always a delight to be here when I can, and especially now to be a part of the conference and to have a chance to talk in chapel. The conference is on life in the spirit, spiritual formation in theological perspective. And this morning, I would like to try to leave a clear or clearer impression on our minds as to exactly what life in the Spirit is like. And actually, this wonderful hymn, it would be hard to improve upon an overall description of life in the Spirit from what is said in this hymn. But you might expect a philosopher to offer a definition or two, and I think I'll just start by telling you what spirit is. Haven't you wanted to know what spirit is? Spirit is unbodily, personal power. Unbodily, personal power. Now, biblically, God is paradigmatically spirit. And that's what God is. He is unbodily, personal power. He acts. God acts. And God's actions constitute his kingdom. God's kingdom is the range of his effective will. It's where what he wants done is done. And we pray, thy kingdom come. And when I pray that prayer, I'm not actually thinking about the United Nations or the larger scene, though I hope it will come there too. I am thinking about my life. May your kingdom come. May your will be done in my life. A spiritual life is basically, in the Christian understanding, it is a life lived from the direction and the power and the motivations and the character of Jesus Christ himself. It is Christ in you that gives you a spiritual life. And of course, with Christ comes his two best friends, God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. And actually, they bring Christ into our life. A spiritual life is a life lived from the kingdom of God it's a life in the power of the resurrected Christ. And it's a life that is available to everyone who will simply come and place their confidence in Jesus Christ. He'll take care of the rest of it. Now, I'm afraid that's still a little abstract. And so today I want to take a number of scriptures and try to help us understand more fully what a spiritual life looks like. And I'm going to center it all on one verse, which I think you all know very well. We even have a song where we can sing it. And that verse is Matthew 6.33. Matthew 6.33. Where Jesus is talking, and uh, would you agree with me that Jesus knows what he's talking about? Right? So when he speaks... We say yes, and then we say, how can I do that? So his word is, seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness, the kind of righteousness characteristic of the kingdom of God, and everything else will be added. He's speaking into a context of people like us that have all kinds of concerns that get up and jump on us when we wake up in the morning if we didn't dream about them. And he's saying to them, now, all of those concerns, you just let those rest for a while and pay attention to one thing, and that is finding 
the kingdom of God. Now, actually, he doesn't say, find it. Did you notice that about the verse? And you might well wonder, well, why didn't he say find it? And the reason is because if you seek it, you will find it. And actually, it will find you. That's the way that works. If you seek the kingdom of God, it will find you. And especially if you understand that Jesus is inviting you to seek it. Now, what do you do when you seek for something? How would you describe seeking? Suppose you lost your keys. Well, when you seek for something, you look for it everywhere. That's what seeking means. And you make that your main project to find it. You're not going anywhere until you find your keys. So that sort of puts it up on the front row. And now you're looking for your keys and you're, you're seeking them everywhere. And that's how you seek the kingdom of God. Okay, now what did we say the kingdom of God was? God in action. So when we seek the kingdom of God, what are we seeking? God in action. And where are we looking for it? Can you say everywhere? Okay? You seek God in action everywhere. That's how you seek the kingdom of God. Now, we're going to try to make it a little more specific in certain ways in a moment, and we will bring some other scriptures that promise very much the same thing, that if you just do one thing, everything else is taken care of. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not lack anything, really. Yes, really, if the Lord is my shepherd, if I've made him and I'm living under his care. See, the Scripture is actually full of these things. We're going to look at some more well-known Scriptures in a moment to fill out the picture. But I want you to have the general idea because you live in a world where you face many, many demands and threats. And it is only an honest response to my situation personally to recognize that I cannot deal with them. And if I recognize that without the kingdom of God, then my life is, as the song says, a short life and full of trouble. It's whenever I step into the kingdom of God, I seek it and, he, and it finds me, that I begin to have the kind of righteousness that is characteristic of it, and I begin to see the action of God in relationship to all of the things that I'm concerned about, including the upcoming finals that you're going to take. So when you take a final, you want to be sure and take it in the kingdom of God. And when you prepare for it, you want to do that also in the kingdom of God. So that's the general picture. Now, one might say, why do we have to seek it? Why isn't it obvious? Why doesn't it run over us? Well, that's an important question. Seeking is fundamental because it is what we are seeking that shows who we are. Our wants constitute the most important thing about our lives. You remember in John chapter 2, some of the Baptists, John the Baptist's disciples, came to Jesus, and as they approached him, he turned and asked them a very simple question. What seek ye? What you and I are seeking is what pulls our life together in whatever shape it may be and makes it what it is. And God leaves us free 
to deal with the issue of what we want. A very famous, famous in philosophical circles story about uh, Bertrand Russell and Father Copleston having a debate. And Father Copleston asked Bertrand, Bertie, what will you do when you stand before God? What will you say? And Bertrand Russell answered, I will say, why didn't you give me more evidence? Now, God has an answer to that. And the answer was, well, Bertie, I wanted you to have a chance to do what you wanted to do. Because that's who makes you, that's what makes you who you are. So let me ask you this morning as you are here in this quiet moment, what is your life really about? What are you seeking beyond your major, beyond the grades, beyond good letters of recommendation from your teachers for that professional school you hope to get into? What are you really seeking in life? That's the deepest question anyone can ask you. And it is a very dangerous question. And that's why we need to ask it. And that's why God doesn't jump down our throat. If God wanted to, he could put an end to all deviations from his will simply by being present. But when he came incarnate in the form of his son, he came in an inauspicious way. And even after he had been raised from the dead, he just appeared to some of his friends. Now, if it had been me, I would have uh, gone over to visit Pilate. <laughs> right? And I would have said, uh, let's have that conversation about truth again. Right? <laughs> or perhaps the chief priest. But he didn't do that because he wanted them to choose. He wanted them to follow their wants. He wanted them to be the person who makes the decision. And that's why the kingdom of heaven is something we have to seek. Do you know what? If you don't want to know it, you don't have to, at least for now. And now is what we're concerned about. And that's very important for God to preserve that. But now, on the other hand, he makes it available so that we can find it if we seek it, if we begin to put it first on our agenda. Jeremiah, in his uh, well-known statement in Jeremiah 29, 13, says, if with all your heart you really do seek me, you will find me. See, that gets you back again to the question, what is it you really want? See, we're, it's very tempting for us. We have our projects. There are things we want. And we'd like to have a little help from God. See, that's, that's not thy kingdom come. That's my will be done. My kingdom come. And the greatest threat to the kingdom of God in my life is my kingdom. And God gives us space. He makes the kingdom available. He made it available in His Son. He makes it available in the Scriptures. He makes it available in human history. And above all, He makes it available right next to you where you can know it now and today if that is what you want to know. If you really want to know, we have a song, Holiness, holiness is all I long for, really. If that's what you long for, you will find it. But sometimes our songs don't quite coincide with the realities of our heart. And Christ comes to us now and he says, you have a lot of things to worry about. Just do this one thing. Make it your primary objective in life to find, to interact with what God is doing in your time. 
That is the doorway to eternal life. Now, God is all in favor of it. You don't need to worry about having help from him. The help will be there. It's simply a question of our settling in our lives what that amounts to. Now, you know, I think, that that was Jesus' gospel. If you look at Matthew 4, 17 and other passages, you'll see that when Jesus came preaching, his word was, repent, for the kingdom of the heavens is... And now we have trouble with the wording. And there's been a lot of misunderstanding about it. But let me tell you what he was saying, and this is seen from the realities of how he dealt with people and what happened to them. What he means is the kingdom of heaven is now available to you. It is at hand. It has drawn nigh. Those are ways of translating, but I think it doesn't get the real sense, which is it is now available to you. And the big change in that was it's now available to everyone who will simply look at him and trust him. Everyone. No longer do you have to have the right... Okay, you fill in the blank. The right whatever. Because the conditions that had been laid down had made or so it seemed, had made the kingdom of God, the reign of God, the action of God, the rule of God, something that was not available to most ordinary people. And the point of the Beatitudes is to make clear that the people who were down on the human scale could come into the kingdom of God where blessing is. And Jesus' gospel brings the old news that there is a kingdom of God down to the level where the people who say, I don't qualify, could, by trusting him, enter the kingdom of God. That's called the new birth. If you read John 3, you will see that it is a kingdom of God passage. And now what does it look like? more specifically. Let me give you three passages. I hope that these may be familiar to you, uh, but if not, they will be after today. Some of you will have memorized Joshua 1, 8. And if you haven't, make a note, look at it. Because it coincides with what Jesus says about seeking first the kingdom of God. Joshua 1, 8 says, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. He didn't say it won't depart out of your bookshelf or your book pack, out of your mouth. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. Then you will make your way prosperous. Then you will have good success. Do you see the parallel between Matthew 6.33 and Joshua 1.8? Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God. What's the kingdom of God? It's what God is doing. What is the law of God? It's what God is doing. It's God ways, God's way of acting. And of course, the law refers much more than to just the Ten Commandments, but it, it includes those as well. The Ten Commandments are how God would act. The law, as Paul says, is spiritual. The law is holy and righteous and good. The law is a good thing to keep it to fill your mind with it, brings a substance that will direct your life according to it. You don't just have to try to do it. You take it in, and then as you take the substance of the Word of God into you, it directs and motivates and empowers you 
so that whatever you're doing is in conformity with the kingdom of God. And that's why you make your way prosperous and have good success. Now, Wheaton has a wonderful program of studies, but they cannot guarantee you what that verse guarantees you. Unless they enable you to come to terms with that verse, which is, whatever you do will prosper and you will have good success. Now, that's repeated in Psalm 1. I don't have time this morning to go to that, but if you would, take Joshua 1 8 and parallel it with the first Psalm, the first four verses, and you'll see the same prob- promise. You see, the word is a primary dimension of the kingdom. It's a primary dimension of the kingdom. It's active. It's creative. It's redemptive. And when you take the word in, it is a substance to your soul. And that's why Jesus, you will remember, said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And when we take the word of God into us, not just a verse here and there, you need some passages and you need to take them in. I always recommend Colossians 3, 1 through 17 as a good place to start because in many ways it has the whole reality of spiritual formation uh, in it. Let me give you another verse. Hopefully you know this one as well. This is Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 through 7. Listen so to these words. Now what are we talking about? We're talking about a spiritual life what it looks like. Listen to these words. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. And I emphasize now, verse 6, in all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make your paths smooth. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn from evil. Let me just take the one part of that passage. In all your ways, acknowledge him. That goes goes with the earlier passage from Joshua. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you will meditate. Okay. All your ways, acknowledge him. A spiritual life is a life of one who acknowledges God in all their ways. Now, what does that mean, acknowledge? Well, it means, first of all, to recognize His presence in everything that you do. Don't just take it on yourself. You have to get over the idea of your own sufficiency. And the reason why many people do not find God tangibly present in their life is because they're still running their life. God's address is, in a manner of speaking, at the end of your rope. And when you get to the end of your rope, you will find God. That is why many, many people have been converted seriously life-changing conversion by praying what is called the atheist prayer. Oh, my God, if there is a God, save my soul if I have a soul. And you would be surprised how many people have been soundly converted by that because they were at the end of their rope. A spiritual life is the life of a person who acknowledges and expects God to be involved in everything that they're doing. Now, obviously, that means surrender, doesn't it? You have to give up the idea that you can run your own life. And that's why the proverb says so clearly, don't be wise in your own eyes. Now, quickly, let me just give you one more passage. There's so many that we could refer to here. But one of my favorites in how to lead this life is 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 5 through 7. Peter says, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, for God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. 
Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time. I hope you will see the parallel between Joshua 1.8 and Proverbs uh, 3, 5 through 7 and this passage. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time. You see, all of them have to do with leading a life of sufficiency, but leading it from the hand of God. Would you like to be exalted? Probably you would. But it's not clear that it would be good for you. God knows when it will be good. And that's why the Scripture says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. That's God's action. The hand of God is God's action. That means you acknowledge Him in everything. You depend upon Him in everything. You humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. And when the time is right, God wants to exalt you. God wants to exalt you. If he can just get us to lay aside our efforts to be exalted and involve him in our lives, he would like to exalt you like a grandparent loves to exalt their grandchild, except that's not even a beginning at what it's like. But it's more important that you be in a position to be exalted. And the way you get there is by humbling yourself under the mighty hand of God. We have a hard time with humility, you know. We have a hard time even talking about it. And you may have heard something like, if you're really humble, you wouldn't know it. Well, ask yourself, how are you going to obey this command? Clothe yourselves with humility towards one another. And we have jokes about the man who writes the book on humility with 12 full-page photographs of himself, (laughs) things of that sort. What does it mean to be humble? To be humble just means that you're realistic about yourself. That's what humility means. And if you are realistically about yourself, that will bring you to God. Because being realistically about yourself immediately sees that you cannot manage your life or your career or whatever it is you're managing, that only with the help of God can you make your life work. That's why humility is so important in this overall picture of the spiritual life. Now, if you are humble, you are in God's hands. That's the humble person. It isn't someone acting mortified and Uriah heapish to take a Dickinsonian figure. Uh, It's the person who very simply just is who they are. And I give you three Steps to humility. I'll show you my full paid pictures later. <laughs> Actually, what I've found is it's, it's quite simple. It has three steps, all three of which begin with a P, so you can use them to preach a sermon. <laughs> One is never pretend. Don't pretend. Now, you're going to have to learn how to do that, okay? But just learning not to pretend, getting your body to where it doesn't pretend before you've thought about it, will require some training, some teaching. Just never pretend. That'll help you. That'll take a great burden off of you. Just think of all the energy that human beings put into pretending. Hmm? Secondly, never presume. Never presume that you should be treated in a certain way. Don't assume that you are down. Don't assume that you're up. Just again, be who you are, where you are. Never presume. 
It'll save you a lot of disappointment if you will do that. And finally, never push. Stand for what is right. Stand for who you are. Stand for God. But let him do the pushing. And if you'll do those three things, you'll have to learn how to do them. You will find it possible to submit yourself under the mighty hand of God, and he will exalt you. It's really important that you understand that if you're humble, that doesn't mean you're passive and that you don't do anything. That means there isn't anything that you wouldn't undertake if you thought it was right and good because you are under the hand of God. Well, this is available to anyone. Doesn't matter what your qualifications or your lack of qualifications may be. It doesn't matter if you're tall or short, if you're homely or an absolute knockout, have athletic ability or those of a snail. It doesn't matter. You don't have to be deep intellectually, though that can help. And you don't have to be, have a good background. You begin where you are and you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And you will know the fullness of a spiritual life if you simply stay on that path. Shall we stand for a benediction? Heavenly Father, in the midst of many words, be our teacher and give us the simple lesson to our hearts, each one individually, and bring glory to your Son and his cause in this world in answer to this prayer. Now may the grace of God rest upon you lively, today. Amen. You're watching WETN, a service of Wheaton College. For information on our programs, call 630-752-5061 or email wetn at wheaton.edu. A video program guide is available at wetn.org.